Hello and welcome to the Miskatonic Playhouse. I am the backstage manager Hedge, but tonight I am your keeper of arcane lore and we are going to be exploring Chaosium's new game, Rivers of London. It's based on Call of Cthulhu, but there's some new spins and it's based on a set of books by a man named Ben Aranovich. First of all, a short introduction to the game. Welcome to Rivers of London, the new role-playing game from Chaosium based on the books by Ben Aronovich. As police officers and civilian consultants with a special assessment unit, the Folly, you're sworn to protect the people of London from all manner of magical creatures. If you already know Call of Cthulhu, you'll feel right at home. Your characteristics and skills have a score from 1 to 100%. Roll your score or below on percentile dice to succeed half your score or below for a hard success. A one is a critical success, and a hundred is a fumble. You can spend luck to improve a roll, or push, roll again, and risk disastrous consequences. You start with a set of common skills, like navigate and stealth, and some combat skills. You'll choose a few to upgrade, and add a few expert skills, like computer use, occult, and sleight of hand and some investigators take advantages like social connections, a signature weapon, or extra speed. Others learn magic. As a classically trained Newtonian practitioner or a roguish hedge wizard, you'll start with just a few spells. To use them, you'll need to spend magic points and pass a skill roll. Other magic users will notice distinctive tastes, smells, sounds when you cast your unique signari. If you fail your magic roll, your spell goes awry. Fumble, or push it and fail, or cast without enough magic points, and you risk serious, even fatal injury. Combat, magical or otherwise, is fast and dangerous. Damage usually ranges from one to five points, depending on the weapon and your rolls. If you take one point of damage, you're hurt. Two in the same scene, and you're bloodied and impaired, but you'll recover by the next major scene three damage in a scene, and you're down, incapacitated, you'll need a full day or luck to recover. Four points of damage in a single blow is a mortal wound. You'll need medical help within the hour, a week in hospital, and 20 points of luck to survive. And five points in one attack is fatal. Spend 30 luck immediately, or your investigator is dead. In short, you're squishy. But remember, you can always try to flee. If your enemy pursues, it's a chase. On each round, you describe where you're going, and your GM decides how to get there, using raw speed with movement and decks, or dodging obstacles with athletics. Or maybe it's a car chase using drive. If you succeed on two turns before you fail on two turns, you escape. Otherwise, the enemy catches up and the fight is back on. Clearly, working with the folly can be stressful. You don't need to track sanity points, but you may occasionally need to pass a power roll to hold it together. If you fail, you're impaired. Any roll of 90 or more is a fumble. You may need a break or therapy or luck to recover. Or in some cases, you may remain impaired until the end of the case file. Stay safe out there. Make the folly proud and keep the people and rivers of London safe. On well, you've just heard a short introduction to the game that explains some of the rules. I'm going to be taking my three intrepid investigators through this brand new world, and these three will be discovering the game for the first time. First of all, our regular host, Newman. Hello, I am T.A. Newman, the host of the Miskatonic Playhouse, and tonight I am really excited to be playing this game because I'm a big fan of the novels. I've got like the last two to go, loved them for years and years and years. I'm going to be playing Morgan Omens, who is a police officer from Dundee, which apparently doesn't mean they speak like Crocodile Dundee. It's a, it's a Scottish accent, so uh, I'm going to love doing that later. I'm willing to drive down there and kill you, just to be clear. <laughs> Steve, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Steve, tall halfling on the socials, and I'm going to be playing Mina Patel. She's originally from this area, but grew up in the U.S., so I don't have to try and do a fake accent. She does data entry at the Folly by Day and plays some music at night. 
Thanks so much. And finally, Rena. Hi, I'm Rena, and tonight I will be playing Jules Garland, who's a chancer. And I'm from London and living in London, and no, I will not be doing an accent because I don't want to be killed off in intros. That would be a much simpler game. <laughs> All right. Rivers of London is a magical world, but it's also based on modern London. And all of you have, in different ways, ended up working in association with the Metropolitan Police Force in modern London. Let's maybe start with Morgan. Morgan, you were recruited in a fairly normal process. A normal process for someone who has had magic most of their lives. You have been connected to this world, you've known about it, you've grown up knowing that magic is a thing, and you were taught magic growing up. Do you want to tell us a little bit about who taught you magic, how you ended up with it, and what your backstory is? Yeah, so Morgan grew up in Dundee in a private boarding school. It didn't really get on with that university, and ended up getting a job in a betting shop. Not too long later, a pal, Joey, introduced us to a bit of sword fighting, a bit of a sword fighting class, a bit of fencing, a bit of back and two FRTA, and actually really got into it. But the instructor was quite an interesting person. The instructor saw the potential in me and asked me to join at a bit of a higher level. It was an invite-only group, but it turns out that group didn't just fight with swords. It turned out that they were also using a bit of magic in their sword play. One of the senior pupils there was also a cop. And, you know, a step and a throw. It turns out that Morgan went down that route with a few um, very clear role models in their life. Brilliant. And you ended up being recruited to go and work into London, where there's real work, because money is a clear issue for you. And actually, the job offer was quite good. The pay was quite good. And you're recruited to come and be a detective constable in what's called the Foley, which is this old, old odd seeming boys club based in London, but they're attached to the police force. And so you know the lingo, you know that in London they refer to magical cases as falcon cases, you know that they've had a lot of success hunting down some rogue wizards, you know they call you a hedge wizard, but you like to think of yourself as being fairly appropriately trained. And over the course of the last 6-12 weeks you've been completing the official training process to become a policeman in the Foley. And when they were putting together your group, they kind of decided that they were going to try and bolster individual police officers by giving them some civilian contacts. And you managed to wangle one of your friends into one of those roles in your team, your friend Mina. Steve, do you want to introduce us to Mina? Sure. Mina does data entry work at the Folly by day, eyes glazed over a bit. She is very good with people, though, also extremely dexterous. She plays piano, she does a little bit of acting, she does some digital music. She's surprisingly good at disguise and knows a little bit of Urdu. Nice. Yeah, so Morgan, what is it that caught your eye about Mina? Why is Mina the one you managed to wangle into this? Part of my life is, is music and talking to Mina as a real person on the force in this place where it can be quite isolating, this slightly clandestine view of what magic is. It was quite amazing to find someone who was also kind of linked into this world to a degree and be able to talk to them quite normally and have those connections, have those conversations. Whereas your introduction to Jules was a little different because actually <laughs> your introduction to Jules was her getting held and in and out of prison a couple of, in and out of jail at least a couple of times, but generally able to be more useful than problematic. Is that about right? Yes, very useful. I've got skills. Much more useful outside of prison than inside it. How did you switch from being a chancer to ending up working with the Foley? So a little bit ago, not that long ago, because I haven't been working with them very long, but I got into a little bit of trouble, just a tad bit of trouble trying to fleece someone out of some money. We don't need to talk about that. But while I was being processed again, there was a case involving someone who spoke Filipino and they didn't have a translator. And someone who'd been arresting me before happened to realize I spoke it, seeing as I'm half Filipino myself. Turns out I knew who they were talking about because I'd scammed them before. So I was able to give them a little bit of help and they suddenly realized, oh, she actually can do things other than fleece people out of their money. Nice. So, gotten a few odd jobs. 
So what are your two advantages, Jules, just above expert skills on your sheet? I'm speedy, I can move very quickly, and I have knowledge of London. I know things. You know things. Excellent. So you ended up agreeing, I assume, for the cash, an upfront cash, no doubt, to go through this same training process. You've been trained in the process of becoming a police... Confidential informant. A community outreach agent, which is a fancy way of saying informer, yes. <laughs> but you've been paired with a particular officer, Morgan Omens. And the three of you are in for your very first briefing. You're sat down in the briefing hall in the side building of the Foley, and, well, a striking man walks in. He's an older gentleman, maybe in his 40s or 50s, but he's dressed straight out of the 20s. He's got a cravat on, a beautiful tailored suit. He's walking with a cane, elegant mustache. Seems to be from another era. There's this TikTok feel about him, Morgan. Very controlled, very organized. You, of course, recognize the governor, Nightingale himself. This man is meant to be the most powerful wizard in Britain, potentially the world. And he says, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Earlier, I received a telephone call from our colleagues at the Charing Cross Primary Care Unit. There was an incident late last night at Stone Waters Bookshop on Nero. They believe it will be of interest to us. One of the booksellers, our see Mr. Warwick Anderson, was assaulted at approximately 10.30 at night while rearranging a display in the bookshop's basement. Mr. Anderson, though somewhat concerned, managed to telephone the emergency services. The call handler sent a response team to the bookshop, where they had to, dear, they had to force entry in order to render assistance. Our colleagues from Charing Cross carried out a search of the premises while Mr. Anderson was being seen by the attending paramedics. They found no alarms trip, no evidence of a break-in nor of anything having been stolen. However, there were fairly obvious signs of a disturbance. In the basement, apparently, it seems to match the description given to them by the victim. I would like the three of you to interview Mr. Anderson to establish his recollection of events. Oh, according to this note, he's awaiting you at the Cappuccino Lounge. I'm not sure why he's there. That's also a new road, so it must be beside the bookshop. Once you've spoken to him, I'd like you to visit this bookshop, carry out an inspection, including an initial vestigium assessment, that's for you, Morgan, to determine whether this indeed is a falcon case. The owner, Miss Saffron Jackson, will be on hand to escort you. The bookshop usually opens at 11 a.m., it's 8.30 now, and by all accounts, Miss Jackson is keen to resume business at the earliest possible convenience. Since this is your first case, I would like the three of you to report back to me once you've completed your initial inquiries, and I'll await your findings with interest. Are there any questions? No, sir. Excellent. Great. I will hear from you in a few hours then. Thank you all very much. And he marches smartly out of the room. So the three of you are sat in the side building of the Foley. It's a beautiful old Georgian building, really, really beautiful entrance. But this room itself, the chairs are plastic and there's a stand at the start. It's this very classic, cheap police space inside a beautiful building. And the three of you are sitting there sort of, I guess, a little bit confused as to what's happened. But you have your first case. Right then. Ah, uh, Mina, that was, that was Nightingale. Maybe I was saying about Nightingale. I don't remember what you said about Nightingale. He was like casting magic and that during the, the war, like the Second World War, that man. Question, I'm good at reading people. Did I get a sense that Nightingale is old enough to be active in World War II? Ooh, that's fun. Give me a, a read person roll. That's a 25 under 60, which is a hard success. He walks like someone from another age. He looks like someone from another age, but there is no way he is old enough to be from another age. Although that does click in with what Morgan's told you, which said that he is apparently aging backwards. Huh. World War II, you say? Hey, it's just rumors. It's extraordinary. But I tell you what, the rumors in what we're doing, half of that stuff is true, right? Sometimes. I'm thinking, was it Cappuccino Lounge? And I'm there kind of flipping over my notebook, having just looked at those kind of notes. 
Let's just recap just before we go anyway. Stone Waters Bookshop, Warwick Anderson, uh, Salted 1030, called 999, first entry. It says he's waiting at the Cappuccino Lounge for us, which we think is beside the bookshop. But the owner is Saffron Jackson, right? I think when we get there then, if we're seeing Mr. Anderson, might be feeling a bit shocking that I think the idea of uniforms and that being there might calm him a bit. Jules, I think play it cool, you know, probably best not to, you know. I don't know what you're insinuating, Morgan. I really have no idea whatsoever. Nothing. I'm not insinuating nothing. I'm not going anywhere until you sign this and I push over the consultancy fee form. Right. Uh, yeah. Always get it signed before you actually do the job. No, no, quite right. It's been approved. Civilian consultation. And I'm not paying the bill uh, and I'll sign it. Thank you very much. Your service is appreciated. Do we know if we've got like a police car or are we going to be cycling around on bikes or? This is over a new road. You could probably take uh, underground apps up easily. Perfect. But uh, if you wanted, you could send a car out from the pool and see what you get. Right. Should we just go on the tube? It's a lot more comfortable than police cars in my experience, personally. Hey, probably a bit quicker as well. Come on then. I love that Morgan is clearly from Liverpool with an Irish dad. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. <laughs> I said Crocodile Dundee. That's what I was going for. Okay. Nero isn't too far away. It takes you about 20 minutes on the tube and you are standing outside the Cappuccino Lounge, which is one of these generic, slightly hipster bars that's been popping up everywhere. Inside there is a uniform standing and he appears to be guarding a blonde man, quiffed hair. He looks like he's maybe in his early 20s. He is sitting, he's very well put together, but he does look a little bit tired, anxious. The uniform beside him looks sort of stoic and bored, and the three of you can enter the shop. On the way over, because the tube now doesn't mean you, you can't use your phone and your 4G and things like it used to, can I just research Stonewater's bookshop? You know, we're going to go and assess to see if it's a Falcon case, and I just want to just a quick background check on stone waters as a building or as, or as an area okay so this is a beautiful moment where i get to explain the luck rules associated with rivers of london rivers of london generally the luck rules are the same as call of cthulhu but the way we set it is we roll 2d10 and then we add that to 50 so all i'd like you each to do is roll 2d10 plus 50 and that will be your luck so your average luck should be 60 oh i got two eights so 16 so 66. 66. Wicked. And I would like a luck roll to determine whether or not you have enough internet, because it is 2016. It's 2016. On the tube to properly do this analysis. Oh, I see. Okay. I rolled, ooh, 39. Under 66. Excellent. You're on one of the newer lines, so it is quite fast. Stoneswater Bookshop is the biggest chain of bookshops in the UK. There's one in the town centre of nearly every town and city. It is a big, big set of bookshops. If you were to change those two words around, you might come up with a real world parallel. Shop books. Waterstones, my friend. It is Waterstones. <laughs> <laughs> Do I get anything on, rather than the chain, which I probably would have looked at first, just making sure and whatever, but the actual kind of building itself or the area itself any kind of just historical... Your Gonan needs to go and spend some time in a library or on the computer for a brief period. Yeah. On your phone, you can figure out that it's a big bookshop chain. Okay, cool. Thank you. Anything else, Mina or Jules, that you would like to do on your way to the Cappuccino Lounge, or are we going to enter this first major scene? I'm good. I think I'm good. I do want to note I rolled a 10 and an 8, so 68 luck. Nice. I have 64. So you're our luck roll. Yep. So when things go really badly... Wait, no, that's a different game. <laughs> when you approach this man, hopefully you're going to flash your warrant card, Morgan. Absolutely. And as he sees you and he sees your warrant card, the man visibly relaxed. He says, oh, ah, ah, you must be the police. I absolutely, Mr. Anderson. Do you mind if we sit down? Of course, yes. yes. I'm waiting to meet you. <laughs> yes. I've got my notebook out, flip it open, get a pen out. Do you mind just running through the events of the last night for us, please? Just leading up to the assault. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, I, I, I can do that, sure. What I'm going to do for you all is I'm going to upload this statement to the Discord channel so you can read along. He says, 
I was I was working in the basement. It was, I don't know, around 10.30, give or take, moving the celebrity bookshelves to the other end of the cookery section. When I was hit in the back of the head by something, I turned around to find Banksy's wall and piece at my feet. The paperback, not the hardback, or else that would really have hurt. Thing is, I was supposed to be the only one in the shop. There was no sign of anyone who could have thrown it, so I was rather spooked. I went upstairs to take a look around and make sure no one had broken in, but all the doors were locked and I couldn't see anyone. I was feeling a little bit annoyed at this point, so I gave up and went back to restocking the books. Next thing I know, I got hit in the head by a soft toy of all things. <laughs> the ones we keep at the till. I was just about to turn around and catch you when I threw it red-handed when a really big tash and art book caught me in the back of the head. I, I staggered to the phone and dialed 999. It all gets a bit hazy after that. Someone held me into the ambulance where they told me I had a mild concussion. I went home, then I got a call asking me to come back in so I could be interviewed by some special crime unit, which I assume is you lot. I told them there was no way I was coming within 500 meters of that chase. Eventually, Harold, I agreed to meet you here. He looks a little white-faced, a little spooked by the whole thing, like he's shaking a little trying to remember it. So I've been observing him while he's talking. Can I do a read person to see what I can pick up from him? You absolutely can. 25 under 60. The... Base impression you're getting is an accurate and real one. He is spooked. He's a bit scared. He didn't like it. And he doesn't want to go back. And there's no subterfuge going on. Mm -hmm. Right, Mr. Anderson. So what you're telling us here is that a number of incidences, a number of assaults happened throughout the evening whilst you were alone in the bookshop, right? Yes. Windows and doors locked, but you didn't see no one? No. Did you see the objects being thrown at you? Like, was it always in motion, like, or did you see it kind of being, like, in the air and then thrown at you? I don't really know. Uh, I didn't see anyone. I can't, like, give you a description of them. I wish I could, uh, but uh, I'm sorry I remember almost nothing. Oh, no, no, absolutely fine now. That's uh, really helpful in that. Have you ever experienced anything like this before? Not at all. Nothing. I can't think of a single incident which would be noteworthy in the slightest. Working in a bookshop is not the most interesting thing. You know, it's it's a dull life. Quite an enjoyable dull life, but a dull life. Aye, right. I'm just going to talk to my colleagues for a, for a moment, if that's all right. Uh, yes, c c can I go? I just hold on one second for us, will you? Right. Mina, Jules... He's telling what happened as he experienced it, as far as I can tell. He's not lying. He's not covering anything up. He's really freaked out. Hey, Mina. Whoever, whatever was assaulting him used something soft and something soft and eventually scaled things up. Right. Could have clobbered him with the art book to begin with. Escalation. You don't think that's got nothing to do with the celebrity chef books? That seems to be what he was moving. You don't think this is like some angry dead Jimmy Oliver or some such thing? He's a he's a chef. I, I I've seen his program. He's like a like a Labrador chef, you know, bouncing around on that. Always oh, fucking happy about something. Not the one who's always screaming at people, though. So uh, I wouldn't worry. No, no, no. That's Ramsey. He's great. He is. So you think it's a dead celebrity chef throwing books? Maybe because his book isn't in the front of the queue. What it seems like, whatever it was, you know, if there was an instigating incident. It started off, if I'll check my notes here, I was looking in the basement around midnight, so basement location, right? So basement around midnight, so maybe the time is of significance, eh? I'm moving the Celebrity Chef books, you know, back to the other end of the cookery station. I am not saying it's a dead chef, but if it is, I suppose, you know, what I'm saying is, drinks on you. If it's a dead chef, I'll, I'll buy the drinks. If it's a dead chef, sure. Sure. All right. Would it be worthwhile to ask Mr. Anderson about the history of the building before it was a bookshop? Aye, indeed. I wanted to ask about Saffron Jackson as well, who's the owner. Mina, do you want to start with the history of the building and that, see what he comes out with? I can give a shot. And I'm going to go over and sit down with him, see if he needs any tea or anything. I'm sorry, coffee, it being coffee shop. 
I see you sit down. He goes a little bit of a start. He goes, just trying to, to help him settle down a little bit. I was wondering if you knew anything about the building that's the bookshop now. Was it always a bookshop? Oh, no. No, it's told. I think it's listed, to be honest with you. Wait, hold on. That's a Scottish accent. Let me try that again. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, it's very old. Very old. Probably Georgian, to be honest with you. I think it was three shops that were knocked through into one. But no, I don't know much about the history, I'm afraid. I'm not much of a scholar. All right. I'm going to sit with him for a little while if he's still shaky. You know what I reckon it was? I reckon it was a poltergeist. A ghost. I think it was a ghost. I think a ghost did it. Okay? I know that's crazy, but that's what I think happened. I think so, too. I probably shouldn't jump to conclusions, but I like keeping an open mind, is what I'm saying. Has anything like this happened in your shop before? Things moving that shouldn't be moving, or any reports of something similar? No, n nothing. This was the first time. Maybe someone released a ghost into our shop or something. I don't, I don't know how it works. Uh, yeah, Mr. Anderson, I know you might think it's a poltergeist or something like that, but uh, there's going to be an explanation. We're reasonably sure that it's not like, you know, the ghost of a celebrity chef or something like that. And I'll just wink at the other two. Really appreciate everything you've been able to tell us about this. Did you see it was three shops that were knocked into one? I think so, yes. All right. You don't own the building, do you now, no, Mr. No. Anderson? That's Saffron Jackson, is that right? Yes, she's the boss. Right, right. You got a number there for Saffron Jackson? Yes, I do. I can give you a number, but I think she's also down at the shop waiting for you. I, I believe she is. And so he gives you her number? Just in case, like, you know, just, uh, Mr. Anderson, is there anything else you think you could tell us that would be a use for us right now? No. Am I? Can I, can I go? I don't leave the country. Keep your phone close. Yes, yes, sir. Right. And then he scuttles off. <laughs> out of there. The uniform that was guarding him sort of just standing there. Gives a big sigh. You right, Jimmy? You need anything, Gav? Ah, no, I think we're pretty right on this one. we got to go and check out the building and that. Are you off, are you off duty now? Aye, I'm on overtime. Ah, oh, shit. All right, then. Listen, you have a good one, and we'll I'll catch you on the flip side, yeah? Cheers. And you make your way out of the cappuccino lounge, likely with more questions than you have answers. And Stoneswater Bookshop is only a short walkway. Is there anything you'd like to do before you head there? All this talk of ghosts, really. It's probably just someone trying to scare an old man out of his bookshop. Hey, but he does not own the bookshop. Saffron Jackson owns the bookshop. Maybe someone wants to take over running it. It's some kind of rivalry and they're trying to scare him out of the job. I don't know. But it seems far more likely to me than ghosts. Aye. Especially celebrity chef ghosts. Oh, you say that? Right. He was in the basement, right? Basement, around midnight. And he said it was an old Georgian building. Three shops knocked into one. Hey, well, if it's all that knocked into one and that, maybe, it, you know, it's... Connected? I'm, I'm thinking, you know. Okay. Could be a ghost from one of the things or, or, or there's an entrance in there from, from somewhere else. If it's three buildings in that put together, that's a lot to carry. You know, buildings have memory. It's like sense tape, you know, they, they kind of remember things. It's tied into things, you know. See, for a moment, I thought you were going the sensible route, which is there could be entrances and hiding places and things where people could be, you know, coming through to scare an old man. But OK, sure. He was quite young for reference. He was just very raw. Oh, okay. The The voice made me think of an older guy. <laughs> no, no, no. He's just, he's just, he went to Eton, darling. Oh, okay. They talk like that when they come out of primary school. <laughs> it's part of the, the language development. Okay. So he just, he just sounds 60. Got it. You know, Morgan, I can certainly understand how unexpected construction noise can be disturbing. I'd find it disturbing myself. But I would imagine I would get disturbed when the construction was happening. It sounds like the bookshop has been there for a while. So why now? Right, that's a good point, Mina. I don't really know. I'm just thinking about there's something that he's done that's instigated this. You know, he's down in the basement and he's moving bits around. And now if that basement's connected to buildings, you know, it don't take much to disturb like spirits and ghosts and shit. All right, well, there's only one way to find out and get a free pint in there. Sure, Morgan, sure. Let's go and catch our celebrity chef ghost, shall we? Keep in mind, Morgan, I said if it was specifically a celebrity chef ghost, not if it's a ghost in general, just so we're clear on that. 
Aye, right, right. Oh, if it's just a ghost in general, I guess Mina's getting the bears. <laughs> Come on then, team. I'm going to linger up behind for just a moment and give my music business card to the owner of the coffee shop, <laughs> just in case they ever want to have open mic or something, and then go and catch up. They might discover a few of their teaspoons have disappeared. I'm busily working out if I can rewrite this scenario so that it's a celebrity chef ghost. <laughs> we can do this, Newman. We can do this. Spoiler alert. And yes, when you approach Stone's Water Bookshop, the first thing you notice is that one of the windows has been smashed, which is in line with what you were told, that places had had to force entry in order to gain access to the building. You knock on, come up and knock up on the blast door and a fairly beautiful black woman in her probably late 30s, early 40s, kind of comes up to the window and says, Sorry, we closed open at 11. I'm going to hold up the badge. You hold up your warrant card. And she goes, oh, sorry. And locks the door and says, oh, I'm, I, I'm so sorry. Yeah, look, c- come in, come in, come in, please, please come in. I thought you were customers. We are, we're not open yet, obviously, because you're coming. Right. Hi, welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm Saffron Jackson. Well, there, uh, I'm uh, Officer Ormans, and this is uh, Officer, and I'll just kind of gesture over to Mina to introduce herself. Miss Patel is fine. Miss Patel and... Uh, and this is... Just call me Jules. Jules. Everybody else does. N- nice to meet you. And can I get observation rolls from all three of you as you walk in? Ooh. 23 under 60, hard success. Hard success. Oh no. 74. Fail. 14 under 60. Okay. Morgan, this woman is really pretty, so you're not paying attention to the bookshop like you should be. <laughs> now, the other two, however, are paying attention and get to look around. There's a few things you notice. I'm going to pop a map up of Stone's Water. And you've entered via the new rule entrance on the ground floor. And the first thing you notice, yeah, it's quite obviously more than one building that's been knocked through to build a larger one, which Jules to you makes it the perfect place to shoplift. If you were interested in shoplifting books, which you are not, it would be great for that because the books are all over the place and there's more than one entrance and the tills at this end quite easy to walk around the corner and sneak off. They put in a lot of processes to try and avoid that. There's strategically placed mirrors that give them access to some of the dead spots and there's obviously quite good CCTV around here. But even with all of this stuff, you're pretty sure that this would be a place where it'd be pretty easy to nick some of the stock. If you were into Nick and books, which you're not. Well, maybe not today. It's not like I need reading material or anything. No, definitely not. Mina, you take a very different tact when you're looking around. Uh, You also notice the multiple shops, but what you notice when you walk in is that this one was clearly the biggest of the three shops, and it's quite a gorgeous space. Specifically, it's a very high space, so it's not got a nearby roof. In fact, it goes up two stories up to a beautiful dome skylight above you. It's one of these old round skylights that you see in a lot of the Georgian buildings of the time. It's a beautiful period piece. You can't see it from the outside and you can only really notice it if you look up in this building, but it is just a gorgeous bit of architecture that has probably been lost to time. You don't exactly know when it's from, but this is a beautiful old building. But Morgan, you are focused in on saffron. How can I help? Right, is it uh, Miss Jackson? Is it is it Miss Jackson? Mrs. Jackson? Miss Jackson. Miss Jackson. All right, Miss Jackson. So I've got a few standard questions I just thought I'd ask you before we get started with the interview. Are you currently in a relationship? I'm not sure what that's got to do with anything, but no, no. I know it's just it's not me. It's a standard questioning, I'm afraid. No, I, I'm I'm not. Right, right. Neither am I. That's funny, isn't it? Right. So are you okay? Have you experienced anything here? You feel safe at the minute for us to be able to talk? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, yeah, I'm fine. Right, right. And have you spoken to your, your employee, Warwick Anderson? Have you, has he told you what's happened? I've sent him a few messages. He's, he's not coming in. So I've got to work all day now. Oh, that's very good, yeah. Very brave of you, if I might say. You know, very brave thing for you to do. Yeah, well, I've been up since early this morning because of the police, so it's it's a lot, but yes. Aye, right, yeah. We're obviously here to help in that. Um, yes. We do have some more direct questions, if that's all right. 
Of course. I can't do it. Want my statement? That'd be ideal. Well, then he started this morning. I got a phone call in the early hours from a police officer asking me to come to the bookshop to take care of the door. They said they'd had to break the glass to get inside to see what had happened to poor Warwick. They left shortly after that because it was all kicking off in the piazza, a fight in the bar or something. I don't know. Next, I called the maintenance company to send someone over to board up the door and clean up the glass. Once the maintenance guy got here, I checked around to see if anything was missing. It didn't look like it. But it's hard to tell it on the mess downstairs. I've not touched anything down there because one of the officers told me not to do it until you've been to see it. Yeah, yeah, so if you'd like to follow me, I'll take you to the basement. I don't want to tell you how to do your job, but I'd really appreciate if you could hurry up. I'd like to get everything all squared away again before opening time. Right, of course, and we don't want to be a bother. Do you mind if my civilian consultants, they're obviously coming with us and that, but their specialty is like peeking off and doing things and seeing things, like, you know, divide and conquer and that? Social role? <laughs> when the police sound sketchy. What? Never. No, that's just Newman. When Newman sounds sketchy. That's true, it's an 87 over 30. Brilliant. So would you like to push this role or accept the uh, consequences of your mistakes? I think I'd probably accept the consequences. I think Morgan is fully aware that they're not really a social creature. It's not really their... I think they probably think they are, but they also recognise their significant flaws in socialising. Uh, I'd rather, if you don't mind, you all come downstairs so I can get you to do what it is you need to do and then I can open up the bookstore if that's, if that's all right, officer. I, I absolutely just be prepared. There may be some follow up questions on that, but I will come downstairs, see the scene of the incident. She takes you downstairs into the basement. And if you look on the Stones Water map, she takes you to the right hand side of the basement into what is the cookery section. There are just dozens of books lying in a giant pile on the floor. She was, it's, it's how I found it. <laughs> so is this. We're still on the floor of the actual bookshop at the minute, in the public area. You're in the public area, you're in the basement, in the cookery section, which is the right-hand side of the map. Right. And are there any other doors or rooms around here? Like, is this it? Is this as far as we go? Well, through that door there, and she points to a nearby door, is the staff area. And then we've got areas just around the corner, upstairs. So it's over two floors. But the incident happened here. One thing I'm good at, can I sense Vestigia? Yes. So for our viewers, our listeners potentially, Vestigia is the feeling that magic leaves behind. It's often described in terms of tastes and smells and sights that don't quite line up with what you're experiencing right now. You often experience them whenever you're moving around. I just generally life build up brings Vestigia. When you start learning magic, you begin to sense the difference between strong vestigia left down, and it is seen as the result of large concentrations of magical energy. So one thing you can do is you can sense vestigia, and that lets you tell if magic has happened in an area recently. And indeed, all three of you can make sense vestigia rolls if you wish. Could I suggest, GM, that perhaps we've got a little signal or something? Might just be something as simple as just kind of like, you know, flicking the chin or something like that, but it's almost like a, this is the go. Yeah, yeah, this is the go time to just check, because it can be difficult to sense. Jules and me now, please roll two. Mm -hmm. I got an 88 over 30, so no. I am very grateful that Rivers of London is not Call of Cthulhu, because I got a 95 over 30, mm. but 100 is a fumble in this game. Yes. I got a 28 under 60, so I succeeded. Yeah, that's a hard success, isn't it? It is. Standing here, you get background London. You always get background London. Background London is the crowd and the noise and the desire. It's smoky and it's loud and aggressive. Here, in this spot, it tastes of violence. Not just acts of cruelty. It's more than that. It's the kind of violence that is just completely destructive. You'd almost go as far to say slaughter. You get the feeling of burnt plasticine and that screaming echo of the crowd sitting cross-legged, bright lights, watching something. 
all of those things come to mind in this spot and it's screaming and it's aggressive and there's blood in your mouth and then you're back in the room. Mm -mm. That's a fairly strong vestigia. Something is happened here. This is magical in nature. And is this like a general area of resonance or is this like located to an item or an area or... Well, what might interest you is that Jules and Mina shake their heads when you look at them, but both of them are standing a little bit further away from the books than you are. I give them a nod in terms of like, definitely have sent something. I want them to know that I've sent something. But whilst we're talking to Saffron Jackson, I'll just say, uh, Miss Jackson, you might be able to close in about the building. Like, we know it was once upon a time, three buildings I, before it was like knocked through. You don't happen to know, do you? What businesses were here? What used to be here? I'm, I'm sorry, it's not really my thing. It wouldn't even begin. Sorry. Right, right. Jules, while uh, Morgan is flirting with the pretty lady, you have lots of space and time to wander off here if there's anything you'd like to check out or do. Mm -hmm. You're easily forgotten. It's part of your charm. Oh, yes. Works pretty well for me. Thank you. So I didn't feel anything weird here, even if Morgan says that they did. I want to have a look around and see if there's any signs that it could be human in origin. I've got probably some experience with B&E, so anything of that sort that could be taken, signs someone could have broken in somewhere or been hiding somewhere, waiting for Mr. Anderson to come down in the evening, things of that nature. Do you have any expert skills you think might match this up? My skills are only languages, apparently. I'm going to ask for a stealth roll. Okay. Because I think this is your understanding of the process of being stealthy. 51 under 60, regular success. 51. So you note that there is a fire escape, which could easily have been accessed, and the area the book is in and where Warwick would have been in, you wouldn't necessarily have had to use the main stairs in order to throw things at him. And this place is so complex, it would not be particularly tricky to run rings around him and not be seen. That's something you've already determined. Mm. However, you're pretty sure that whoever would do that would not be able to avoid being caught on CCTV, which you're seeing evidence of pretty much everywhere. And it doesn't look like anything was stolen or taken, like gaps where people could have run off with things, as far as I can tell. It's a book drop, so it's quite difficult to tell, but Saffron has specifically said she doesn't think anything was taken. Okay. Mina, I'd like to give you the opportunity to do something in here too, to try and uncover some more information as well. Is there anything you can think of that you'd like to try? Ms. Jackson, you said that the police who were on the scene called you to come in and take care of the door, yes? Oh, y yes. Not really my place, but on behalf of the department, I apologize we should have perhaps asked you to come and take a look at your employee before the physical place. And I am saying this in a way I am hoping to see whether she made that priority or whether the officer in the scene actually said the door is the important part here. That's a read person. This is an interesting, I like it. You know what? I like it so much that I'm going to give you a bonus die. Okay. That's a 29 and a nine under 60. Hard success. I really appreciate that. That's very kind of you. The shop had to be secured. I understand the police, you know, it's a Saturday night and they're all busily fighting drunks. They don't want to be dealing with some bookstore. Don't worry, Warwick's a darling. I checked in on him. He's a little bit concussed and he's a little bit scared to come into work today. I understand that. We're just busy, you know, right now. We're expanding the collection, you see. We just got all these new celebrity chef books in and I'm very excited to expand the celebrity chef section. So we moved the children's section upstairs and the cookery section down here so we could expand it. And it's been a, a really good choice, I think. Mina's going to need a moment to process the idea that the place where this happened used to be the children's section. You can come back to me. Can Morgan kind of bounce on this then with the same conversation? Is that all right, GM? As if we're both standing there? Yeah, yeah. Hey, Miss Jackson, you've swapped over your children's section with your cooking section, eh? I get that. Did you not also mention that there was a fight in a bar somewhere in the piazza? Yeah, that's why the, the police couldn't spare anyone to guard the door. Is that nearby or is that like unconnected? Sorry. It's a Saturday night in London. There's people fighting, you know. Hey, right. Yeah. No, 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 they're very good. But hey, as, as my colleague said, you had the children's section down here. Uh, yes. 
it's very popular. We run weekly sessions where the children come in and they we read to them and it's really nice. But no, we've we've moved the children's section upstairs, which is much nicer. We don't have to move the prams up and downstairs. Hey, but you never had any disturbances or the assaults on your staff? Nothing like that happened, did it, before the children's sections were moved, right? As the celebrity chef section appeared down here, is what I'm hearing you say. I don't understand your line of inquiry. Hey, that's the way I like to work, Saffron. Sorry, Miss Jackson. All right, let's end this now. Hard social role is what you're going to need to get the date. Oh dear. If you get a hard social role, I will give you a date with Miss Jackson out of this. Oh no, I rolled a 53 over 30. So you're not a type? I just mumble to myself. I just see the kind of look, I guess, like disinterested look in her face and just look over to me and mumble to myself just saying, hey, married to the job, as always. Are you done? Can I start clearing these away? Uh, not just yet. Miss Jackson, would you mind just giving us a moment here? Just investigate further. Do you mind if I have a look through this door here into the staff room? Uh, yeah, I can show you the staff room if you like. Mina, do you want to come with later or do you want to stay here? I'll catch up in a moment. Right, you tell Jules where I've gone, will you? Of course. Hi. She goes into the staff room with you. There's a few rooms back here. There's a staff toilet. There's a staff room where they obviously take their breaks. There's a microwave and a fridge in one corner. And the only other door is to her office, which she sort of points you at. Give me an observation roll. Oh, can I use some luck? Yes. So I rolled a 36 over 30, so I'm going to use six points of luck, please. There is quite clearly a CCTV output in her office. All right, Miss Jackson, do you mind if I get access to your CCTV there? Don't you need a, a warrant or something for that? You're absolutely right, but sometimes we can uh, be a bit expeditious with this. Like, obviously, if you've got sensitive stuff on there that you don't want us to see, like we can get a warrant and come back. But I was just thinking more about the idea of you just letting us have a look. You know, we only want to have a look at the last 24 hours and that, innit? Whilst Mr. Anderson was here. There's no real reason why she would stop you, so I'll give you a bonus die on this social role. Oh, no. But she might be a bit scared to be alone with you because of your creepy, creepy behaviour. So I'm not creepy. Sorry, this is another social role, but with a bonus die. Yes. Okay. A one. I've rolled a one. Oh, man. Critical success on the social role. She gives you the eyes, then the two of you are alone, and opens the door into the CCTV room, where you are able to review the CCTV. Eventually, I assume Mina and Jules, you come back in because Morgan's been in there a little bit too long. And, you know, Mina, you know Morgan well enough <laughs> to know they shoot their shot when they can, but, you know, it's inappropriate when on police business. So you wander in and you find them reviewing the CCTV in the office. And it goes down pretty much exactly how Warwick said. From almost out of nowhere, as Warwick is moving books from the children's section to the chef section and back, a book comes flying out. Where the book comes from is hard to tell because it kind of comes out of the stairs, which don't have CCTV coverage, and hits him. And then as he's turning around, he gets hit again. And then suddenly, this you can see. There's nobody there. Mm -hmm. And just books come flying at the poor guy from every direction, smack him in the head. He falls to the ground. He gets up, dazed and confused, comes upstairs, dials 999 before basically collapsing against the side of the till. Nothing else happens until the police get there. There is no evidence that anybody else was in the building at any point. So there's no other activity or anything between when he gets to the phone and calls the police and when the police arrived? Just nothing? Nothing. With a one, okay. there is nothing. You know there was nobody else there. Right. And activity only in the basement. Now upstairs. It's all done here. As soon as he goes upstairs, he's safe on the phone. So right, we're thinking something down here. Hit me out, Jules, Mina. You got a Georgian building, right? It used to be three shops, knocked into one. Is there something in this moving the children's books? Like it might be that there's activity that's been here before, but like if he's moved children's books out and then all these books have been thrown at him. I'm kind of saying this now so that Saffron Jackson can't hear. Is that okay? Sure. I know poltergeist behaviour, things get moved around, the escalation of like things moving, throwing, etc. But the children's books have been moved upstairs. That might be a bit of a childish act. You know, perhaps we were dealing with little ghosty kiddies, you know. So they're cranky because their books got moved? Well, alright, let me tell you this. 
nervous, did you? That I sensed. I'm telling you, it was not nice. It was violent. It was destructive. I felt like acts of cruelty, slaughter. There's a, a, a smell of burnt plasticine, you know? And then like the sound of like a crowd watching and that. So sounds like two things. One, this is going to be a case that falls into your particular division, but also two, we need to look up the history of the building because something happened here. Aye, absolutely. Tick for Falcon. Tick for something going on here. Lovely. But we've given up on the celebrity chef ghost, have we? Aye, not, not right yet. You never know. Well, you did describe slaughter, which might be murderous or might be the other kind, and burning things and a uh, crowd watching. So perhaps, so there actually is something to that. So essentially in that case, you're saying it's the ghost of previous Hell's Kitchen contestants. Right, right. Uh, hear me out. GM, can I just ask, in regard to my spells, because of Morgan being magical, has a permit to learn Newtonian magic, he's trained you know, as a hedge wizard, as long as I'm doing it in a way that's not obvious to the public and stuff, are you happy for me to play? You are licensed to use magic. You are not meant to use it in front of muggles. Muggles. <laughs> okay. Right. Are we thinking here uh, ghosts? Right. We're thinking ghosties, yeah? So far, so good. GM, would you like me to read from the spell for our listeners? I'm planning on maybe using a spell. Or are you happy for it to roll out as it rolls out? What are you planning on doing? Well, I think... As I said at the intro, in this huge fan of the books, but it's here in the Rivers of London book, a wear light spell. It says ghosts are drawn to the magical energy of the wear light and they enjoy feeding from it. So I was potentially going to cast it and then walk with it and let Jules and Mina kind of observe and see if anything happens. Sure. Uh, give me a magic roll. We'd probably get rid of Saffron Jackson and ask her just to say... Yeah, so we assume that she's getting ready uh, upstairs. I'll tell Jules and me, and me and I'll say, right, I'm just going to cast a wee little spell here, just a little a late spell. Hey, just bear with me. And I will conjure this light maybe about 10 inches away from my hand. So that's a magic roll? Yes, yes it is. Right, let's roll magic. Uh-oh. All right, 55 under 60. Okay, yeah, and you're presently in the staff room, right? Yes. No, was it her office? Her office, in the staff area. Yes. You conjure the wear light, and it forms a small glowing ball in your hand, as it has done every one of the thousands of times that you've cast this spell. And you make your way to the door, and you open it up, and you head into the celebrity chef section. And as you do so, it fades from a white to a red right and then it disappears which you're aware is what happens when a ghost feeds on your wear light or something at least feeds on your wear light but what doesn't happen and would normally happen if it was a ghost is that the ghost does not appear so normally in this situation the ghost would appear and it would then ask for more but nothing appears is that how it's supposed to go uh, no, it's uh, the the eye, the color change, but the ghost is supposed to appear. So you're sure you did it right, Morgan? I am doing it right, Mina. It's just like just asking. Are there things that can eat funky lights and not show themselves? I probably. As otherwise, it's a user error. It's not a <laughs> right. Watch this. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> Magic. You create another beautiful, perfect white ball. And it shades. Hey, watch in. To red. Hey. And it disappears. That's the bit where we're supposed to be like, hey, that a tasty wear like that. Can I have some more? Can I get a sense for Stitcher roll from you there, Morgan? Because you've fed this thing quite a lot, huh? Uh, oh, 58 under 60. The feeling of violence hits you again, and suddenly you're no longer in the bookshop. Suddenly you are in the ring and you are fighting for your life while there is light all around you and screaming and people sitting in a circle. You are the only light in a never-ending darkness on every side of you. 
you are fighting for your very survival amongst these giants that stand around you in every single size. You are bleeding and dying, but you've just got to keep going. It is hell. And then you're back in the room again. I will immediately kind of communicate that. Am I physically okay or have I taken a beating? You're totally fine. Totally fine. This was just a flash. It was like a dream sequence almost. It was a connection to the vestigium and the strength of the overwhelming feeling of that. Right, right. I'm telling you, I've, I've, I've seen it. These, these, these giants in, in a ring and, and then they're like fighting, batting the shit out of each other like for your life, for your know, for survival. And there's people screaming and cheering and right, whatever was happening here or whatever is happening here but not here. It's that, you know, there's something going on here. Like a underground fighting ring or some shit like that. Would your friend the wizard know more? Nightingale. I right. They ain't much Nightingale don't know about. But we can report that this is Falcon, 100%. We can tick that box. We've done our vestigium assessment. Aye, confirmed. But it would be great to go back with maybe some answers. Morgan, I don't want to go down this, this line of thought, but are you sure they were giants and not just much bigger than you? Were you perhaps... This was the children's section. Were you perhaps very small? GM? Did I sense, did I feel that they were? Alan, the, the feeling of size difference was immense and very alien and very confusing. Um, yeah, you, there's, there's something... You, there's something there, but you can't, like, yeah. Mina, they were massive. Mina, do you think you could use uh, the computer in the office and uh, research, see if there's anything going on here? I hate to admit it, but you're usually better at that than I am, but I can certainly try. I'm good at putting things into computers, not getting them out again. There's a call from Saffron upstairs asking if she can come down and clean up the mess. It is almost 11 a.m. Uh, Jules, Mina, is there anything else here? Do we go back and do a bit of debriefing? Oh, we at least need to do some research. Hi, right. I don't think there's much we can get out of during the day. I mean, perhaps we can come back this, see if she'll let us come back this evening and see if the incident repeats itself. Hey, midnight. But I don't think we're going to get much else from here at the moment. We've already seen something's eating your lights. Hey, Mina? Jules, when you were looking around... Is there any place we haven't seen? I'm thinking especially the first book we saw came from somewhere near the stairs. There's places you can be without being seen, but there's no way anyone could have moved around in here to throw things the way we saw on the camera without being caught by the CCTV. It's impossible. You could hide, but once you start throwing things, you're going to be seen. So... Fine, it's probably a ghosty thing. Right, I think we let Saffron back down here. And as you head on out from Stone's Water Bookshop, Saffron gives you a very flirty wink, Morgan. Miss Jackson, hey, this is a car in case anything else happens, you need to get in touch. That's my office number. Hey, that's uh, very kind of you, thanks so much. You're welcome. Right, um, on duty and that, so hopefully see you around. Um, we'll be back. Uh, Jules, Mina, uh, let's go. Jules is giving Mina a look in the background like, how did he finally manage to score? <laughs> <laughs> there are certain questions I have learned not to ask. Magic. Newman, would you roll a D100 for me? Uh, I got another one. I got it genuinely. I got another 001. You are barely out of the door before Saffron sends you the text. Yeah. Nice meeting you. Hope to catch you soon, and a little, like a little love heart. <laughs> Excellent, and a winky face. Jules, Mina, hang on a second. I'll just send one back saying, "Not if I catch you first. Handcuffs. I never knew it'd be so much fun flirting with Hedge. This is a whole new level of the playhouse. This is great." See, Newman, what you don't know is this means that this episode is going to blow up on the Symphony Discord, and you never know <laughs> and understand why that's a thing. <laughs> Morgan, you do realise this is why I don't invite you to my gigs? I've been wondering why I'm not getting the invites and that, but hey, what can I say? It's pure Scottish magnetism. 
Oh, is that what you are? By the way of London and Australia <laughs> and everywhere else. You are the most <laughs> scouse sounding Scots I've ever heard, but okay. Hey, my great great grandmother's neighbour's brother was from Liverpool. It is around 11.30 and you are back at the Foley where you meet up with Nightingale in the main atrium for Elevenses. The all thin woman in a Edwardian maid's outfit comes towards you and serves you tea in a beautiful china cup. Boiling hot steam boils out of the kettle. It's in a beautiful little warmer. And Nightingale is sitting in a big old leather smoking chair. He says, so, why don't you give me the debrief? What have you found? Well, sir, we have Anderson. As it turns out, we believe has had a, a real experience here, sir. You know, his, his statement said that he was moving chef's books, all right, with the children's books and that, moving them around, you know, and then around midnight in the basement, you know, hit with books and coming from everywhere. There's a bit of history as well to the building, sir. George and three buildings knocked together. I think the most gratifying part of the investigation thus far, sir, is that the vestigium assessment is absolute positive. Sir, I did it myself. There's um, a sense of you know, violence, acts of cruelty, destructive slaughter, burnt plasticine, the echo of a crowd, the bright light. B- between Jules and Mina and myself, we, we thought perhaps ghosties, uh, ghosts, sir, and I uh, produced a, a well light to see if it, we'd get a response and perhaps some, a communication. But the well light, it was ingested, it was uh, devoured, but no, no ghosts, sir, in which we repeated. Uh, and it was on that repetition that, that I felt like I was drawn to another, another place and there had giants and, and I was getting battered around like in a ring, like fighting for my life, fighting for survival, people cheering that, but blood and bone, breaking, bruising. And and uh, when I say giants, sir, uh, I mean giants. I don't think giants have left the Scandinavian mountains in decades. Are you sure about that? <sighs> it's what I saw, sir. Could it be something from the past in that case? So what are your planned next steps? Research the building, see what things happen there. The building seems sensible, yes. I go there at uh, midnight, you know, sir. That was the time of the incident with Anderson. Yes, that sounds quite sensible too. Some research, discovering what may have happened there, and then returning to the site and location of where it happened. Any other thoughts about what you're dealing with? We don't believe it is a ghost, sir. I'd agree generally with that, yes. This sounds unusual. Likely some sort of uh, genus loci that is formed in the area. Not sure what that means exactly. It's a rather catch-all term. What I recommend is you return with a little bit more knowledge of the area, the history of the area, and see if you can communicate with it. Perhaps pull it out and see what it needs. Aye, sir. Sounds about right. Uh, Mina, anything to add? Sir, have you had any reports of anything in or around the piazza last night? Can't quite decide if that was just where the police officers needed to rush off to, or... No. Yesterday, Peter accidentally destroyed a building on the south side of the Thames, but nothing in your area. Uh, right. Don't worry, that's normal for a DC grant. If he's not leaping off something to his imminent demise, then disappearing accidentally into elven lands and then returning and being saved by a river, he's not having a good Tuesday. Sounds like a real great chap. I feel like he has, what's the, what's the word people use for these days? Main character syndrome. <laughs> he does give a bit of that off, sir. Jules is just shaking her head. Uh, right, we'll leave you be, sir. I will go and do a research and make plans for tonight. Great. So the three of you have the run of the Foley before this evening. The shop closes around eight, so you have the best part of eight hours to do research, run any errands or do anything else you want to do. The way we're going to do that is I'll just go round, see what each of you wants to spend your time doing. We'll have a few rolls to sort it out, and then I'll give you whatever information. So it'll go a little bit faster. Let's start with Jules. What sort of information are you looking for? The Foley has a more mundane library Mm -hmm. for research on places and histories. It has a magical library where you can find out more about anything magical. And you're also welcome to hit the streets, check out contacts, and try and get more information in any other way you can reasonably imagine. Mm -hmm. You have the knowledge, after all. So, I guess, because I'm not the best at research, that's not kind of my thing. I don't spend a whole lot of time reading things and looking things up. I'm more of a people person, really. So I'll go find some of my contacts from around that area where the shop is and see if they know anything about events that might have happened here before it was the bookshop, any strange or suspicious activity in the area, things of that sort. 
there is a guy, you know, there's a fence that works sort of nearby that he's always been a bit of a history buff and he just knows stuff. Mm -hmm. And he's good because he's willing to buy stuff that other fences aren't, specifically odd esoteric stuff. Mm -hmm. And actually, you have heard rumors around the Foley that he is apparently part goblin. But you've been told never to say that to his face. Mm -hmm. And it's not odd. He works out of a dumpster, but it's not like, it's not filthy. It's just, he's got one. It's in the end and it's been scrubbed down. It's got a nice little seat in it and he has his Wi-Fi in it. And it's actually pretty nice, but he works out of a dumpster. When you head on down towards that way and you see him and he's typing away at a little laptop inside of his dumpster and he looks at you. All right. What's up, Jules? Oh, same old, same old. His name is Larry. I feel like his name is Larry. Larry. Larry the fence, who is a half goblin, but must never be said that he is a half goblin. Got it. How do I help you today? You got anything for me? I might have a few things coming down the line. I've got a few jobs in the works. Maybe a few books for you. Might be in it if you're interested. Anything fancy? You know, the older, fancier kind. Yeah. Anything Latin. Latin is big right now. If you find me something with Latin in it, that'd be lovely. Latin. I know a guy who's got a weird library. I can talk him up a little bit more. Okay, I'll have something for you. In the meantime, I was wondering if you know of anything odd, strange happening around is it New Street Hedge? New Row. New Row. That's what it was. If you know anything strange or odd happening around New Row, especially in the last week or so. In the last week or so? Nah. Nothing interesting has happened in New Row in a hundred fucking years. What happened a hundred fucking years ago? A hundred fucking years ago, this place was the fucking bomb, I'll tell you that. This place was the fucking heart of some of the best fucking cockfighting this city has ever seen. i would tell you that. Cockfighting? Yeah. Hmm. Oh, it used to be amazing, right? Oh, I used to train the birds. We used to get good, good money for training birds. I fucking loved it. But that, that was a long time ago. No, no, I can't do it anymore. I tried for a while to run a legal ring, but it got shut down in the 70s. Cops stopped taking bribes. Like, what the fuck's a cop for if we can't take a bribe? You know what I'm saying? Yes, it's quite useless now, really. Quite a shame. So you were running something up until the 70s? I was trying, but it just didn't really work. So nothing has really happened in this area since probably the 1850s. Mm. Do a few things here and there. Uh, you're not working for the Isaacs, are you? That's the fully the people you are working for. <laughs> Fucking Isaacs. Well, they're the sort that cleaned up this place. They pay well. Hmm. They pay well. Mm -hmm. I think they'd be interested in some books. Got a couple of copies, some stuff. But Greek, I can't shift the Greek stuff right now. They might be, you know, they've got a big fancy library, so if it's something they don't have, they could be interested. Fucking Isaacs. I know. Anyway, how can I help you? So, was there a ring operating out of the building where the, the bookshop is now? Or one of the three buildings that got fused together? Give me a luck roll to see if he remembers. 42 under 64. Yeah. The building was the one with the the skylight. Best fucking cold fighting ring in the fucking country, I'll tell you that much. Interesting, interesting. And it was only birds they were fighting there? Yeah. What else are you thinking, like? Oh, uh, I don't know. Dogs? Ah, nah, dogs are no fun. Well, sometimes people get heated up and, you know, illegal boxing rings and things like that back in the era. Uh, nothing on this street, nah. Uh. A couple of streets down, there was some boxing. Okay, okay. That's really helpful, Larry. You're the best. Always. Always a pleasure, Jules. Next time, bring me some shit, though, yeah? I'll get you those books. Don't worry. You know I'm always good for it. <sighs> you never stay mad at you, won't you get? Give him a charming smile. Brilliant. And we'll assume that you have a, a WhatsApp group set up <laughs> so that any information one of you learns, the others can act on. Mm-hmm. So we're going to go to Mina. Mina, what are you going to do with your afternoon and evening? Access to multiple libraries, the internet, computers. You have the entire police force at your disposal. You can even add actions into homes, which is the system that records all the actions, and some will be automatically done for you. I'm not terribly good at research. You have the Met Police at your disposal. But I do have, as one of my advantages, connected, can pull strings with powerful people. Going to make the very best cup of tea my aunt has ever taught me how to make and go have a chat with Nightingale and talk with him about old times and see what he remembers either about the area 
or possibly about things that ate wear lights that weren't ghosts. Do you want to go spend more time with Nightingale? I figure in my world, he is a powerful people. So the sad news is that Nightingale is presently on a mission because it turns out that Peter has uncovered the fact that there is a building full of vampires in the east end of London, and the two of them have gone to secure the building, but it's causing a right riot and hundreds of police are being deployed, and actually the place is a bit empty and there's just you guys in the building, so you can't presently use Nightingale. However, there's probably someone that you can interview about the history of the place. There is an academic, his name is Post Martin, who is sitting in one of the libraries who's happy to help and have a chat with you. Post Martin and you get on absolutely fantastically, and he's the brains. Nightingale's very much a fancy soldier. Post Martin's the, he has a chair at Oxford, so he's one of those gentlemen. All right, and he works here at the Folly? Well, he mostly spends his time in Oxford, but he has been known to work in the libraries occasionally too, and he happens to be here today. Okay. I have my very, very nice cup of tea. Not having been able to schmooze with the boss, I'll go and schmooze with him instead and see what he remembers about either the area or things that eat wear lights that aren't ghosts. Thank you, Mina. That's very kind. How can I help you? I'm still new to the field, you know. I know what Morgan tells me, but I am not sure exactly what to believe. A, a wear light, I think he called it, that's supposed to attract ghosts. He says he's never seen it go from white to red and vanish without anything showing up. Oh, yes. And you know more than he does, certainly. Well, yes. So when the practitioner generates the wear light, they are generating magic. And the magic is some kind of energy. We're not entirely sure what, but imagine it is potential energy that is being generated. And ghosts are little more than the imprints, the spirits of people, the shapes of people, if you will. And so they feed on the magic to become more alive. And when you feed them magic, they tend to pop back into existence. They become visual. They become seen. Otherwise, it takes them energy to do these things. But there are other things that will feed on magic. Any magical creature will easily feed on your magic, whether that is vampires who will feed on all magic in an area, or whether or not that is any of the thousands of minor genus loci who inhabit this world. They tend to be gods of small things. The river goddesses are a good example, or you occasionally find gods of places that are incredibly important, churches or old parks or anything with a specific belief in London with as many concentrated people often pops into existence if it exists low enough, some kind of representative of it. So those are the sort of things that might eat a werelet. Hmm. Don't suppose you've ever heard any juicy stories about fighting rings run by giants or anything like that? Fighting rings run by giants. There's probably some things the Scandinavian literature about such things, but no, not here in London. No, giants don't tend to feature in London. Hmm. Well, and we sit and we chat for a while. Yeah. Give me, I'll give you a bonus die on the research roll here, just because Postmarket is helping you. Okay, thank you for the bonus die, because it was going to be a 96, but it is a 26 under 30. It eventually helps you narrow it down, and it's the text from Jules that helps you piece it together. It is giants in comparison to the size of the animals fighting, which in this case is cockerels. Elm Row used to be the site of a cock fighting ring. And if you head on to the discussion, you will see the information you find. And would one of you mind reading that out for me? Cockfighting. Cockfighting was once a highly popular and very lucrative spectator sport in London and elsewhere in the UK. Historically speaking, its roots go back over 6,000 years, though it first became really popular in England during the Tudor area. By the 18th century, the blood sport was at its height, with all levels of society indulging in the heavy betting that accompanied each match. Upper-class venues like the Royal Cockpit, whose last remaining traces are cockpit steps by Birdcage Walk, charged a hefty admission fee to keep the riffraff out. It took around two years to fully train a fighting bird due to the amount of money required for the training and the size of the wagers on fight days. This blood sport was tightly regulated, more so than any other sport at the time. It was finally banned in England and Wales in 1835 under the Cruelty to Animals Act. And finally, Morgan, what have you been getting up to in the last few hours as Jules and Mina have been mining these various experts? I'm torn between two avenues of research. One is to see if I can go further down the line of the actual properties and what they've been over the years and perhaps kind of you know, activities that happen there. 
But the other, which I think Mina has already possibly successfully done, was to research the idea of kind of magical fight clubs and kind of see what the relevance of that is. I was either going to hit the books in the folly if I knew that there were certain sections or volumes that I think could help me, or I was going to see if, you know, because I am an apprentice there, to see if there was somebody that I could speak to that was of the magical variety, not necessarily in the folly, but kind of, you know, Jules has gone and spoken to their contact. I was wondering if there was any contacts that perhaps Peter's mentioned over the last couple of years, or perhaps I've seen Nightingale with, or that I've made my own acquaintance that I can go and speak to. Is there someone in particular you're thinking of? Because I know you know the setting really well. I don't know if it's way too big though, but I was thinking perhaps one of the rivers, one of the tributaries or something, someone perhaps who might be a bit more willing, maybe someone like Beverly Brook, who is a bit younger and a bit more akin with modern lifestyle and modern policing. All right, you're going to have to explain to us all who Beverly Brook is and how you know her. Okay, I'm going to say that Morgan knows Beverly Brook because Beverly is Peter's girlfriend and Beverly Brook is one of the many daughters of the bigger rivers, the bigger physical representations of the rivers and therefore has been around in one form or another since since these rivers existed and there were these entities, these genius loci that represented them. So has seen history unfold literally before their eyes. For the record though, Bev is the same-ish age as you. Bev is at uni. And so when you text her, she agrees to meet you for a pint just outside her uni block, which is in the east end of London. And you travel out by tube and you find yourself in One of the hundred or so pubs within the M25 named the Red Lion, which is the most common name for a pub in Britain. Bev is a beautiful black woman with long dreadlocks down the back of her hair with a cheeky little smile. Her eyes are very slightly creeped up in the corners, giving her a distinct look that really makes her stand out. And she is sitting drinking rum and coke in the corner, which she definitely didn't pay for. You come in and you slip in on the sofa beside her. Hey, you're right there, Beverly. All right, Morgan, I've got like an hour, so what's that? Thank you for meeting me. I really appreciate it. I'm a bit of a weird one, you know, there's a bookshop. Slightly confused man brings you a beer without you asking. Hey, uh, right. So for those who don't know, the rivers have a glamour, and so things sometimes just go very, very well for them. Yeah, right, Jez. Like there's a bookshop, Stonewaters. Uh, yeah, everyone knows Stonewaters. You know, it's a specific one though. So a guy was in there, he was moving books around and stuff and like sorting out the shop and that, you know, midnight, shit hit the fan, books started flying, started hitting them, all this kind of stuff. We checked it out, sensed the place and there was right weird shit going on. You know, we're talking like fight clubs, violence, cruelty, slaughter, crowds cheering, all this, right? Presented my way like a couple of times and the things got eaten. There's no ghosts, nothing's shown up, nothing's there. I'm wondering if you knew about any entities or genius loci. I'm confused. Who's dead? No one yet. Then I mean, who cares? It's a, bit, a bunch of books flying around a bookshop. I mean, Nightingale cares. He's the gaffer. All right. Well, a bunch of books flying around. Right. So it was a ghost? No, because we did the well light and the colour drained and then disappeared, but nothing appeared. No one showed up to say, can I have some more, you know? So it's some spirit. Right. Kinda. Maybe. Right. Was something important there? I don't know, like some tree or some important building or like a worship site? Right, maybe. It's a bookshop, right? But uh, it used to be like at Georgian times, it used to be three different buildings and they were uh, all knocked together. What was where the thing happened? Right, it were a bunch of children's books and then the guy at the shop, he moved the children's books out of there. But what was, what was there in the past? What was there before? Right. Have I got messages from Jules or Mina about any of this? Yep. You know, you've a WhatsApp. They've WhatsApped you. Mm-hmm. They've WhatsApped me. Just remind me, Jules, what did you find out? Big cockfighting ring in the main central building. Right. And do I get the kind of the message from what Mina's discovered as well? Yes. So it was cockfighting the rings. You know, like the fighting birds, like pecking each other to death and that. All right. So it's some spirit of fighting, I guess. Right. Or like anger and violence. Sounds dangerous. Y- yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. But not like a person or nothing, just like the spirit of anger. Is that what you're saying? I mean, maybe. Have you tried talking to it? No, not yet. We think we're going to swing around tonight like, and have a chat. 
or, or fight. All right. Most of us are reasonable. Apart from Ty, my sister, she's head on wheels, but yeah, talk to most of us. We're just human. Right, right, right. And if you were facing like a spirit of anger, how would you like calm it down? Like stop that shit from happening? Don't know. How do you calm down anyone? Give them some tea? Right. Have a pint? Right. Well, we're just people, right? We're not special, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I know. It's not like, you know, you wake up one day in your river and you suddenly have insight into thousands of years of history or anything. Oh, I thought that was exactly what it was. I'm just a girl from the East End. So, go talk to it. See what it wants. Cup of tea. See what's got it upset. It's throwing things around, so it's angry at something. Figure out why it's angry and it'll go away. Right, got you. Or at least calm down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Say hi to PR for me. Oh, no, sir. <laughs> And she wanders off. <laughs> I think Morgan is so like mortified that he's had to go to someone and is just like fan personed over them. And it's probably just radiated that they were just stumbling over themselves the whole time. Brilliant. So the three of you gather together once more at the Foley with some information, with some ideas. Do you want to have a wee chat and figure out what your next moves are? Mina. Can I do something first? Yes. Somewhere in this city, Mina knows where to find something like an antique store. Yes. She's going to buy and expense to the folly, of course. Good move. A handful of 18th century coins. I like it. Because maybe the bookshop hasn't paid the admission fee to the cockfighting ring. It's a long shot. Cool. Okay. Morgan's going to go to like a spa or something on the way over and is picking up tea bags, <laughs> milk, some disposable cups. And a few tins of beer, because Beverly said, just have a beer with it, have a cup of tea with it. So that Morgan is literally getting some like cups of tea and stuff and, and a few cans of beer to take with. And probably some snacks, because you're about to go on a late night wander. Yeah, absolutely. Biscuits, crisps, things like that. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And you meet back at the fully, fully prepared for what? What is your plan? Well, <sighs> we're going back. All right. You're going to try and talk to it, Morgan? I, I, yeah, all right. Gonna talk to Spirit of Anger. And have a beer. I, you know, I've always said the best way to calm someone down is have a cup of tea or, uh, you know, have a beer. So that's what we're gonna do. And how do we get it to manifest? We invite it. Sit down with us and have a chat and then ask its worries. You'll listen. One well, of the first things they tell you about being a police officer is one of your greatest weapons of your ears. You know, you can hear and listen. Listen to people's problems. That's what we're going to do. Brilliant. So you head back. It is around eight o'clock at night and you arrive. Saffron invites three of you in, gives you the keys to the place, shows you how to use the alarm, asks you not to move anything too much around and gives Morgan some ridiculously flirty winks and then heads off for the evening. You have the run of Stone's Water. You have some tea, some beer, and some snacks. It's around just after eight o'clock in the evening. What are you setting up? What's your plan? What moves have you got going here? Mina, what's your first move? I was hoping you would know how to speak to something like this. Um, you... Hey, you're right. I know. I'm, I'm happy to go around and do a shout out and pop a well light, give it something to eat, you know, and start talking to it. But assuming we do that in the area where the children's books were, I'm going to try and talk to it. It might not work. What are you two thinking about? Holding up a heavy book so if something gets thrown at me, I can push it off. Or at least protect my beautiful, beautiful face. All right, good idea. Gives me a thought. Perhaps if we start removing some of the books from where he was working last night, it might at least get its attention. Mm-hmm. Hey, maybe we shift all the books from that area. You know, maybe there's more there than meets the eye. We haven't seen everything. Maybe there's some forbidden tome hidden in the children's books. Right. Tea for tome. Aye. One cult, two cult. Three cult, four. I see where you're going. I've got a question. I'm sure Mina would have noticed. If not, she'll go and take a look. In what is now the children's section, we were told one of the first things he was hit with was a stuffed toy. I'm curious, what kind of stuffed toys do they have? Is there anything about that that might have said someone something off are they making you know stuffed little cockerels for instance oh that's good no it's not true but it's good <laughs> no it is a little probably dog it's got a stuffed head and like stuffed little feet but the actual body is a pencil case and they sell them at the till mina comes back downstairs looking a little bit shaken as if she's seen something very disturbing 
So you're thinking of moving these books. Are you removing the cooking books from the cooking section or the children's books from the children's section? I thought we were planning to take the books from the area of activity and take them all out of the area. The cooking books are where the thing happened. The children's books are upstairs in another section. If he was attacked while he was moving books, are there books that have not been moved yet? No, everything is now set up. So he was filling out the celebrity book section, and that looks like it's now been finished to fill out. So we move books out of the area because it seemed to be just in one particular area, right? Based on his feelings of the energy. Right. So if we move them out of the area, it's less likely Morgan's going to get hit in the head with a book. <laughs> Not completely impossible, but it might improve your chances with the ladies. You spend the next hour or so moving most of the books from the cooking section out of the initial area, and you then kind of explore the area a little bit. And now it's sort of 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. It's getting on a little bit. There's been no sign of ghosts. Morgan's trying to get the ghost to talk to him. I generally just make some noise. All you've really done is shift a bunch of books and do a bit of manual labor for 90 minutes now. The section is mostly cleared of books. They are now sitting in big piles at the bottom of the steps. And as, Mina, you put down the final set of books, can you give me an observation roll. Mm -hmm. That's a three under 60. It's a bit confusing because there's the books here. There's a pile of books that don't look like they belong in the cooking section and they're in amongst the cooking section books. But no, these, these are some of the children's books. They should have been upstairs. Maybe Morgan brought them down. I will take Morgan's hint. Obviously, he was not willing to finish the job and I will go ahead and start putting some of those children's books back on the shelf where they were. Okay. Jules and Morgan, you come back in to discover Mina is putting children's books on the shelves. Mina? Yes? Hey, what, what are you doing? You brought them down, didn't you? Uh, no. No. Did either of you notice any books over here to begin with? No. These were in a pile right here. What, children's books? I assumed uh, we were trying to put them back, but if neither of you put them there... Yeah, right, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm going to go to my bag. I'm going to pull out a can of beer. I'm going to crack it open. I'm going to cast a wear light. Do I need to roll for that? You do roll me a magic. Uh, oh, 38 under 60. I'm going to push the wear light towards where the beer is. In fact, I'm going to put the beer next to the children's books and then just kind of like, uh, whoever's there, we just want to make sure everything's all right now. We're hoping not to cause a fuss now. We don't, we don't need any violence or nothing like that. Have you, uh, you read anything good lately? Nothing. Is the wear light being... The wear light dims and fades to nothing. Right. Maybe we should bring more children's books downstairs? What do you think is going to happen if we do? I don't know, but there's children's books there. This was the children's book section. Maybe the ghost just is mad at having its reading material taken away. Seems to be stuck in this one particular spot. Hey, but... As soon as we go, the Storm's Water people are going to put the children's book right back upstairs. Yes, but maybe we can get it to come out or something so we can talk to it. Right, right. No, yeah, yeah, I see, I see. Or see if something happens. Maybe something happens if we start bringing them downstairs. I don't know. I like it. Uh, you, you think that's a good idea? Should we? Again, if it wasn't either of you, it was someone giving us a hint, perhaps. Don't suppose you can sense anything around these particular books, Morgan. Can I try and sense vestigial on, on the books that have been moved? Give me a sense vestigial for this. This feels, this feels sense vestigial ish. Oh, 28. I'm rolling eights all the time. 28s, 38s, 58s. 28, sorry, and 60. 60. There is the violence and the anger and the, the slaughter. There is something else. That feeling feels very much like the Signari. So a Signari is a distinctive feel that a specific caster gives. So for instance, you've been taught a little bit about this in your initial assessment, Jules and Mina, so you're kind of aware that each caster has a certain feel. So TikTok tends to be associated with Nightingale. Morgan, see what Morgan's is. 
Morgan has the hideous sound of a guitar being tuned, which is painful for a musician. Yeah, it's a guitar tuning, but there's also this like smell of like changing rooms and stuff. And I think that's because it's associated with where Morgan got into this world of magic. So, yeah, the whole feel is that of violence, but actually the experience you're getting is one that's petulant, expectant, and presently calm. I'm getting the sense that whatever is petulant, expectant, and presently calm, that there is a signet from them that is has been violent. Yeah, so the, the feeling yeah. is... Oh, you're seeing a Signare. I was seeing Signari. We'll have to check. Oh, that might just be because I've read those books in isolation and you say words in your head and that's how they stay. All right, we'll, we'll stick with Signari. That sounds cool. But we may have to check. Okay, so there's the the sense of vestigia of, of the spirit, perhaps. This is what we're putting together. That is petulant, expectant, and calm. But from them having cast magic, their Signari is the... The stuff we sensed earlier, slaughter, violence. Yes. I will communicate that with Jules and Mina. Hey, right now, uh, maybe it's the, the books, the kids' books, Mina. Jules, you're right. There's a sense of calm right now. But still a sense of expectant. We, we talked about kids, you know, like a wee uh, little thing, like having a bit of a shit fit because its books were moved. So try bringing some more books down. Why don't you offer it some tea? If it's a youngling, then it's not going to want the beer. Aye, right, right. Can I sit down and as I'm pouring a cup of tea, I just take whatever the top kid's book is? Green eggs and ham. Where is my cow <laughs> by Terry Pratchett? <laughs> and I'll, I'll pour a cup of tea and I'm just going to open the book. I'm going to sit cross-legged on the floor. Aye, where is my cow? Terry Pratchett, this is... Yo, know, is, this, is this a good book? Have you read this one? You're getting nothing but the anger... The, the feel of anger everywhere seems to be much, much calmer. Right. I think the moving of the books, that's the thing that's had an absolute, you know, real, like, shit fit. So you spend the next 20 minutes reading a couple of children's books to this spirit of whatever, and it seems to have calmed everything down. And for whatever reason, you don't get violent outbursts, you don't get any problems. Somehow you get the feeling of calm and contentedness through this process of reading the book. And it's worked for you. It's worked really, really great. However, you're left with the problem of knowing what to do next. So you have seemingly calmed the spirit for this moment, but what? What are you going to do? You have a spirit in the basement that likes being read children's books. All right, I'm going to take one of the children's books, read it rather dramatically. And as I'm reading, I am going to slowly walk from here to where the children's books are now. Maybe it can follow me. And when it knows where to find readings. The moment you get on the steps to leave the basement, one of the books comes flying at the back of your head and slams into the side of your head. Everybody's a critic. That give me a dexterity roll. That's a two under 80. For whatever reason, you duck. A sixth sense comes over you, and you kind of felt like maybe it would happen when you touched the steps. So you were already ducking and diving. As you stepped away and out of the basement, that's when the book came flying at you. And another one comes flying both at Jules and Morgan. They give me dexterity rolls here to dive out of the way as this thing throws a temper tantrum. 52 under 80. So you dive out of the way. I've got, oh, I've got 52 as well, but I've got 52 over 50. So can I use two points of luck, please? Yeah, so the book hits you, but luckily it's a, a paperback of not particularly high quality. And so it just slams into your face, but you don't get injured at all from it. And you get the feeling, suddenly that feeling, and you all feel it. It's the feeling of someone crying. And it's overwhelming. In fact, can I get a power roll from all three of you? 43 under 60 for me, success. 97 over 50. 30 under 50. So, Jules, you clearly aren't used to children crying, and you are impaired. I think it's less that I'm not used to children crying. It's more like it takes me back to being in the house where my parents argued and fought and screamed all the time, and it would make my younger sister cry. That is on my character sheet, the backstory. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. 
So it just hits you in the gut and you hate it. You hate it with such a passion. You're impaired. Tick impaired on your character sheet. If you roll over 90 for the rest of the scene, then you will fumble. Ouch. Yeah, it's a fun little mechanic, isn't it? <laughs> and so suddenly, you know, you find yourself moving back into the room with the book. But yeah, the, the spirit did not like you leaving with the book. Well, I apologize for that, but we did learn something. Morgan, is there a way to expand where spirits can go so that it can go upstairs to the new children's section? Or are we going to have to figure out a way to keep the children's section down here without saying, hey, you have a poltergeist? Right, right. I mean, there's no direct science to it. You know, it's not like you can just kind of be like, hey, let's make the circle wider. They, they kind of dictate their own stomping grounds and that. So I'm not aware of any way to move it without its consent, without its without its, its willingness I feel like the best bit here is is moving them books down here, but somehow talking to the stone water people. And Anderson's already convinced it was a ghost, but he doesn't own the shop. No. So. I got a pretty good relationship with Saffron. I mean, Miss Jackson. I'm sure I could have a word, you know. Uh, but, but, uh, Mina, Mina, are you, you come here with that book there and just uh, get started reading. Yeah, I'm going to pick up where I left off and come back to apparently where it wants me. So, right, we got to figure out a way at least a couple of times a day that there is a children's book being read to this thing. Children's story hour. Aye, which I'm guessing is what's kept it happy, you know. Or it reads over kids' shoulders when the kids come down here to read. Right, right. I mean, when kids are little, when they're reading, they read out loud. How are we going to... Maybe we we get Anderson to organise like a, as you say, kids' reading hour. Oh, Mina just is here and reads all the time. Our second story is finished and the book is placed down. The three of you successfully managed to leave the basement without any altercations. And it is up to Morgan to try and explain to Saffron this fact. Are you going to try and convince Saffron that she has to keep the children's book section down? Are you going to destroy her dream of having an extended celebrity chef section? What is your thought here, Morgan? What are you going to try and convince Saffron she has to do? I think it is. I think it is convincing her that the children's section needs to stay downstairs to satiate this. I don't know if I talked to her about spirits and things. I guess I kind of have to, to a degree. She's a bit confused to discover there's a childlike spirit of violence in her basement, but... I think she eventually gets the vague idea. Yeah, and and we could, you know, depending on how long this takes, actually take her down there the next night and show her this and read and um, oh, and get Stephen Fry narrating Harry Potter. <laughs> played in, so you get various authors' stories played in the evenings in order to associate it. I think we test it first to see if the the spirit actually responded to that, uh, like a recorded voice. You experiment with all these things over the course of the next few weeks and months as Morgan and Saffron engage in a rather ridiculous over-the-top romance, and together the two of them manage to placate the young genus loci in the basement of Stone Waters, and it needs to have people there regularly, it needs to hear its stories regularly, it needs the company, and the audio tapes work but they don't do as well as someone sitting and reading it a story in the evenings. Before we close, Mina wants to try just once singing to it instead of reading to it. I think that goes down a treat. Hey, she's got a standing gig. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And on that note, thank you very much for trialing out Rivers of London with me. We got to have a wee bit of a play with the rules, but unfortunately, you figured out quite a lot of it. So I was not able to viciously attack you in the final scenes as is meant to happen. Instead, I just got a little bit of violence in it, Steve, for fun. <laughs> that is Rivers of London's The Bookshop, which is based on a short story written by Ben Aranovich. And I think it was a fun little playthrough that introduced the game. Thank you for playing with me. Thank you for trialing out Rivers of London. It was uh, lovely to play with the three of you as always. And that is the end of the show. Please make sure to sense vestigia on your way out the door.